You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Or sometimes if you continue in this action in your life, he'll bring friends that will warn you, stop doing this, man, you're going the wrong way. And here's the other thing, if you stop listening to all of that, God will come in and he'll start turning tables over your life. He'll come in like a hurricane in your life. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He wants to get your attention. And some of you here might be at that place where it's just a still small voice. Listen, obey it before tables have to be overturned. Is the Lord trying to get your attention? Are you close enough to him to hear his voice? As you listen to Pastor Ron's message today, he shares that because God loves you, he will try to get your attention. God desires for you to live a life that is fruitful and abundant in him. He doesn't want you to go on a path of destruction. So oftentimes, as Pastor Ron explains, he will put people in your path to help course correct. But you have to be open to hearing his voice and obeying the directions he gives to you. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 2 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. The last prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 says, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. That's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus tells his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem. They walk in Jerusalem. The disciples don't know anything. And Jesus goes right in the temple. He makes, and they're just as surprised as anything. They're going, what is he doing? And he said to those who sold doves in verse 16, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Notice he calls it his father's house. I'm one with the father. Don't treat my father's house with contempt. Now it's interesting. This is not the only time that Jesus will do this. He cleanses the temple on two occasions, at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. The second time he does it, he actually says, you've made my father's house into a den of thieves when it's to be a place of prayer. Now think about this, this outer court of the Gentiles. It was originally set up so that anybody could come here, anybody could come to this great and grand temple that's to worship the one and living God. Anybody can come here and hear the truth about the living God, that was the idea. It was set up in such a way that anybody could come and pray to God and seek God. So think about this, the one place that a Gentile could come and seek the living God, the one place a Gentile, an unbeliever, Another way to put it, another believer could come and, and find out about God and seek God was here. Yet with all of the lowing of the oxen, the bleeding of the sheep, and the shouting of hucksters, that would have been impossible. God's voice was all but drowned out of this place. The one area that a Gentile could pray, the one place they'd come and maybe hear about God, non-existence. In light of that then, Jesus drives out all these hucksters and these merchandisers in a flurry of righteous indignation. Now that said, think about this. There are people who think of Jesus as weak and wimpy, right? Maybe Jesus is going throughout Palestine in a chiffon tunic, you know. <laughs> ah, Jesus, meek and mild. Well, Jesus was a meek man, but he was a man's man. I would say, first of all, Jesus was physically strong. That doesn't mean that, you know, he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, a bodybuilder, but he was physically strong because no one, not one person comes in with one whip and drives everybody out. That's physically imposing. He had strength. Not only that, when we look at the end of Jesus's life, when he's crucified, he's up all night, he's beaten all night long, early mornings of the hours. He's withheld from water, he's dehydrating, and then he scourged and blood is coming out of his body. He is weak, at least you would think, and yet he's picking up a 200 pound cross and carrying it almost all the way to his crucifixion. He was a very strong man, but way more than that. He was spiritually overwhelming. His divine authority emanated from his personhood so that thousands upon thousands Thousands of people cannot and would not withstand him as he single-handedly drives them all out. Listen, no one challenges him, not even the temple police. The temple police are the temple guard, by the way, were sanctioned by the Roman guard. They were Jews allowed to guard their temple area so that if there was any threatened activity, they could actually kill a person. In fact, we have signs that we've dug up from the ancient temple. It says, if you go beyond this point, you will be killed. And yet no one withstands Jesus, not the temple guard, not the religious leaders, not even the Romans that are even watching this in the Antonio Fortress. 
Jesus single-handedly cleanses the temple. He would not tolerate irreverence for the glory of God's powerful. Now, as I read this passage, I don't know about you, but I have to ask the question, what would Jesus do if he came to the church today? What would Jesus do if he came to the church of America today? What would he do? Oh, man, I think he'd clean house. I really do. I think, first of all, I think he probably, if Jesus came to some churches, they probably wouldn't even want him in. No, you can't dress that way if you come here, Mr. Jesus. You, tunic, you gotta have the suit, you gotta have, all the, you know, whatever. You can't come in here barefoot, you know. Others wouldn't wanna hear what he'd have to say, that's for sure. We don't listen to that. That's hate language, we can't hear that. You're not very loving. You gotta love everybody. We don't wanna hear that, Jesus. If he saw some of the opulence, the utter opulence that is spent, he would probably say, what is going on? If he heard these hucksters on TV begging for money all the time, gotta give your seed money until it hurts, you know. I think Jesus would clean house. He really would. Well, you know what? That's where it's supposed to begin. It's supposed to begin in the church. In 1 Peter 4, 17, it says, judgment should begin in the house of God. Listen, the greatest thing we can do in praying for our nation is pray for the church in America because the church in many respects has become so worldly, there's not much of a difference. We should stand apart. We should be different. And judgment needs to begin in the church of God. That's what needs to happen. That's what Jesus did. He wants a pure bride. So what's the reaction of the disciples as they see this? Look at verse 17. The disciples remember what was written. The zeal for your house has eaten me up. That's a quote from Psalm 69 and verse 9. They were in awe of the zeal of Jesus, the passion. Do you have a zeal for Jesus? Do you have a passion for his righteousness? Do you have a passion for purity? Do you have a passion for holiness? Do you have a passion to share Jesus with people that don't know him? We need that. We should have that zeal, that passion, that when we talk to somebody, this person could be going to hell for out eternity without Jesus. I may never interact with that person and they'd be, they'd be separate from God for the rest of their life. We need to have that zeal. As I mentioned earlier, we put the four gospel accounts together and we know that Jesus cleansed the temple on two occasions. The first, right at the beginning of his ministry, right here, but the second was at the end of his ministry. It actually takes place during the Passion Week, during that very week where Jesus, at the end of it, is crucified. Here's the interesting thing. As I told you, he said, God's house is to be a place of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. But then as he's leaving the temple that second time, he says these words, your house has been left to you desolate. Isn't that interesting? It's not God's house anymore. You're right. It's your house. And it's being left to you desolate. And not long after the ascension of Jesus Christ, Titus Vespasian, under the Roman guard, comes in and destroys Jerusalem, destroys the temple that remains in ruins to this day. By the grace of God, it will be rebuilt again, of course. But here's the thing. Jesus wanted holiness and reverence and it wasn't there. Now, let me also say this before we move on. I want you to know that this is also an act of love. You say, how could you say this is an act of love? I'll tell you why it's an act of love. Because there was sin there, and until the nation can come and receive their Messiah, they must recognize their sin. Tables need to be overturned. Repentance needs to take place, right? You know what? The same thing needs to happen in our lives. And I found that God has done that in my, in my life quite a few times. Maybe he's doing it in your life right now. You know, God is gracious. The first time he speaks to our heart, it's usually a still, small voice. Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. That's wrong. You know, he loves you so much, he'll maybe put a scripture and you're reading it or you're in a church like right now and it's like, ooh, wow, that's, ooh, I don't like that because it, it hurts. It's, it's like God is speaking to you through that verse. Or sometimes if you continue in this action in your life, he'll bring friends that will warn you, stop doing this, man, you're going the wrong way. And here's the other thing, if you stop listening to all of that, God will come in and he'll start turning tables over in your life. He'll come in like a hurricane in your life. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He wants to get your attention. And some of you here might be at that place where it's just a still small voice. Listen, obey it before tables have to be overturned. Some of you might be at that place where tables are being overturned. Your life is a mess right now. What's going on? God's got your attention. Hallelujah, that's great. That's the best place. When God's got your attention, no better place. Now just respond to him. Turn to him. You could be a wayward Christian or you could be one who's not a Christian at all. And God loves you so much. He says, I've allowed this because I want you to see that you need me. Turn to him. 
So certainly Jesus was doing that to the nation. So the first thing we see is this reverence of Jesus. Now, moving on in verses 18 through 22, Jesus talks about his resurrection. See, he's interacting with the people here, and there were one of two reactions. The first reaction came from the disciples. Wow, look at his zeal. But the second response came from the religious leaders. Verse 18, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? The religious authorities saw themselves as the custodians of the you know, temple, and they want an explanation for Jesus's actions. You say this is your father's house, show us a sign. Why don't you prove it kind of a thing? My question is, what more do they need to see? Jesus has single-handedly drove everybody out and no one withstands him. That's power, that's authority, that's glory. But here's the problem. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, the Jews are always requesting a sign. They always wanted something more, something more spectacular. And this happens throughout the ministry of Jesus. Show us another sign, show us another miracle. Jesus finally, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39, he says this, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And I'm not gonna give you any more, just one more. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then I'm gonna rise from the dead. And guess what? In this situation, right at the beginning of his ministry, he gives the same answer. Look at verse 19. Jesus answered and said to him, you want a sign? Here's the sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. I'll raise it up. Now, the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. You're gonna raise it up in three days? So they don't understand what Jesus is saying. They're, they're trying to comprehend Jesus' statement with earthly understanding. And by the way, this happens all the time throughout the ministry of Jesus. We're gonna see this a lot in the book of John. For example, when we get to John chapter three, the next chapter, Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he says, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. He says, how do I do that? Do I have to get back into my mother's womb again? I don't get that. He meets the woman at the well. He says, you need living water. She says, you haven't even brought a bucket. We get to John chapter six and he says, I'm the bread from heaven. They said, are we gonna eat your flesh? They, they just didn't get it. They're trying to understand with earthly reasoning. And this is what happens. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it tells us the natural man, the unbeliever, doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. In fact, they seem foolishness to him. Nor can they know him because they're spiritually discerned. So when you start talking about spiritual things, people just like, what? That's foolish. <laughs> Last night, my wife and I were at a, a wedding and we were sitting at the reception at a table, and, and we didn't know anybody at this wedding. We were just there for some friends, and they were friends, but no one around the table was believers, and we're just there and talking and everything. And everything was fine until one of the guys asked me, what do you do for a living? And then it went south from that point. I'm a pastor. Mm. You know, and everybody turned away from me. And my wife and I, well, we had a wonderful conversation the rest of the time, her and I. That's, that's kind of what happened. All of a sudden, I'm, okay, you're the weirdo kind of a thing, and that's just the way it is. That's the way it is in the world. So Jesus is trying to give them spiritual reasoning. He says, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it up. They go, 46 years to build this thing. How are you going to do it in three days? Now, a little quick history lesson. Solomon's temple, that's the first temple, right, was destroyed by the Babylonians. That happened in 587 BC. But you read the book of Ezra, and remember, God told them through the prophet Jeremiah, you're coming back into the land, which they did. So under Ezra and Zerubbabel, they built a second temple. It was erected in 515 BC. And that is the temple that remained for hundreds and hundreds of years during what we call the intertestamental period. You say, that's a big word. When's that? That's between Malachi and Matthew. All those years. But what happens is Herod the Great comes on the scene. He's given this position by the Romans to kind of keep these Jews under control. And Herod wants to come across as Mr. Nice Guy. So he says, I'm going to refurbish your temple. I'm going to make it greater and grander. So he began it in 20 BC. It actually wasn't completed until 64 AD. And when you go to Israel today, you see the platform, which is an incredible man-made feat, an incredible work. But you see that today when you go over to Jerusalem. So it had been under construction for decades when Jesus says this. So these religious leaders say, you're gonna tear it down, build it up in three days? Listen, that thing's been under construction for decades. So they're trying to interpret Jesus' words on a human level. But we know what Jesus was talking about. tells us right here in verse 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. You'll destroy me. I'll be three days in the grave, and I'll rise from the dead. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, 
His disciples remembered that he said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word what Jesus had said. So know this. The disciples don't understand what Jesus is saying either. They're not the, you know, they're not the brightest crayons in the pack either, right? So the disciples didn't get a lot of things until later. The interesting thing is, though the disciples don't get it until Jesus rises from the dead, you realize the enemies of Jesus at least remember this statement because they bring it up on several occasions. First is in Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus is on trial. We're told in verse 60 that many false witnesses came forward and finally one man said, hey, he said he's gonna destroy the temple of God and build it in three days as an accusation. And then later that week when Jesus is on the cross, Matthew 7, 39, people came by, wagged their heads and said, hey, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, why don't you save yourself? So they remember this statement. They sought to use it against Jesus, but it was actually a declaration of his glorious resurrection. And so one thing we don't wanna miss here is this. Because Jesus did rise from the dead, we as believers will rise from the dead. Because Jesus' body was not destroyed, so we have a new body waiting from God in heaven. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, that we know that when this earthly house, this tent, this body, the Bible calls the body a tent because it's only temporary. When it's destroyed, when it, you know, is eaten up with worms or swallowed by a great white, I don't know how you'll die, we have a building from God, a house waiting for us in heaven. So this body is a tent. And did you know that this tent isn't the real you? Isn't that encouraging? Your body that you see is just a shell. The real you is your spirit. The real you is your spirit. Now, God has given us body so that we can communicate to one another, but this body isn't all that. And the older you get, you realize, hey, this body isn't all that, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, that's true. So I'm so glad that this is not that. I'm glad this, this ain't it. Because I don't know what period of time it gets, you know, you get a little kid and you start growing, you get your teenage, you get your 20s. I don't know what age it actually is where it starts going down, right? I don't know where that exactly is. It's probably different for all of us, but somewhere when you get, in the 30s, or maybe it's late 20s, I don't know. Then it's like, ah, ah, and it's just, you know, going down. And it's like getting old, they say it's like toilet paper. The more you get at the roll, the faster it gets. So, okay, that fell on deaf ears. Sorry about that. <laughs> it worked for me anyway. It's like, it does, it's going fast. Anyway, I so love the fact that this body is not the real you. The real you is your spirit. And the Bible tells us that for the believer in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body will to be present with the Lord. What glorious truth. And so we are encouraged. We are encouraged by that. Let me also say this, that Jesus' declaration that I'm gonna die, kill this body, destroy it, and three days it'll be lifted up, that's a declaration of his deity. He will say later in John chapter 10 and verse 18, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to take it up. Now, only God can make a declaration like that and that's exactly what Jesus did. As he's on the cross with full strength because usually it took days to die on a crucifixion and he dies within hours of his own volition. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gave up his life and then he took his life back again in the resurrection, a declaration of deity. And here's the good news. As Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. And if you will believe in me, though that body, that tent will die, you'll live forever. Your spirit will be with me. That's good news. If you don't have that assurance today, you can have it by giving your life to Christ. Well, let's quickly look at this interesting response of Jesus in the next three verses. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Now, first you look at this, this is awesome. Many believe they saw signs. The word is translated miracles. They saw some miracles. Jesus did many miracles, right? We don't have all the details, but John chapter 21 and verse 25 tells us that if all the miracles were recorded, all the books of the world couldn't contain it. So Jesus did some more miracles while he was here, and it says many believe. You say, that's awesome. Well, hold on a second. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. What do you mean? It says they believed. Well, hold on a second. Very important. The word commit there in verse 24 is the same word translated in verse 23, believe. The, the Greek word is pistos. 
and it means to have faith or to believe. And so if you translate it, it means this. These people believed in Jesus, verse 23, but verse 24, Jesus did not believe in them. That's interesting. Why? Because these people were unsaved believers. You say, hold on a second. Uh, what was that? Unsaved believers. You say, that's a strange statement. I never heard that before. Well, you could believe in something, but that doesn't mean you're saved. For example, I'll give you two examples. In fact, let me give you the first one. James chapter two and verse 19 tells us the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died on the cross and rose from the dead the third day and is God in heaven at the right hand of the father. The demons believe that. They know that to be true, but they're not saved. So you can know and believe in facts, but they're not following Jesus Christ. These people said, oh, we believe in you because they saw some sign, but it was sign faith. It wasn't saving faith. They, they got little tingles. Oh, that's cool, Jesus. But Jesus didn't commit himself to them. Why? Because he knew it wasn't a true conversion. Let me give you another example. We're gonna see it when we get to John chapter six. Again, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus feeds 5,000 people, and it's a very long chapter, by the way, chapter six of John. And it tells us that many were now following him, and they called themselves disciples. We're following Jesus. We believe in Jesus. He provided food for us. We believe it. It was awesome. And along the road, Jesus is explaining to them what it means to follow him. When you get to John chapter six and verse 66, it says this. From that time, as Jesus began to explain what it really means to follow him, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Why? It was sign faith. It wasn't saving faith. Jesus says later in John chapter four and verse 48, except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. So think about this. This is what the world says. The world says seeing is believing, right? Not so for Christians. For Christians, believing is seeing. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, right? We don't see. We believe. I trust in God. I trust in his word. And so Jesus refuses here to cash in on a moment's popularity. He knew the fickleness of Man's nature. Notice verse 25. He had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus is omniscient. He knows what's in their hearts. They just had a few tingles. Salvation is not based on an emotional high, a few tingles, oh, that was cool, that's awesome. No. Listen, here's Christianity in a nutshell, and we'll begin to wind up with this. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, if any man desires to come after me, you, you wanna follow me like those other people did? But know this then. You must deny yourself. In other words, it's no longer about me. My life is no longer about Ron. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about what he wants from his life, his will, his plan. It's not me. I'm not running the show anymore. I must deny myself. I must be willing to take up my cross, die, do whatever he asks of me, and follow him and follow him. Not follow me, not follow us, but follow him. That's what it means to be a Christian. So as we wind up at our time, then let me ask you, are you willing to follow him? Are you following him? Are you denying? Have you, have you made that time in your life you said, I'm no longer in this for me. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. I'm following him. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not based on things he does for me. It's not based on things, ooh, that's kind of cool. No, I believe he is the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead. He is the Savior. He is the Lord. And anything he wants to give me, I'll receive anything. But if I, I do believe in him, and listen to what he promises, forgiveness of sins. He promises the assurance of salvation. But let me tell you, it gets so much better than that. Because eternal life is not just off in the future. It's something you begin to experience the moment you give your life to Christ. It's a new life. It's the forgiveness of sins. It's the cleansing of a conscience. It's having the peace of God in your heart and having rest in him, having confidence, having a close companion, one who will help you in all things, one who will give me guidance and counsel and his word. He speaks to me out of the Bible where before it was a dead book, now it's alive and so much more. You've just heard Pastor Ron Hint and the radio ministry of Calvary Houston here on Large Than Life. Pastor Ron's currently in the Gospel of John, John is one of the four books in the Bible that describes the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus Christ. 
In his short time here on earth, Jesus changed the world and the entire course of human history through his life, death, and resurrection. Whether you joined us halfway through our program today or you caught just the ending, we'd encourage you to visit the link that provides this message in its entirety and other messages like this one. All you have to do is visit ltlradio.org and click on the teaching archive. Do you feel like you're constantly on the go with no time to slow down? You're not alone. And the good news is we've got you covered. You can listen to more of Pastor Ron's message by downloading our mobile app, which is available on our website, ltlradio.org. Were you aware that Larger Than Life is also in podcast form? All you have to do is subscribe. So don't leave that website without doing that. Are you in the Friendswood, Texas area? Do you have a church you call home? If not, we'd like to invite you to join our community as we worship Jesus together. Service times and directions can be found on our website, ltlradio.org. That's all the time we have for today, but we hope you join us again to hear more great teachings right here on Larger Than Life.